pretty cool. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Okay, so this is another interview style video, uh, similar to the one I did a couple of months ago. Uh, it's totaled over just over an hour long, so I've broken it down into two parts. Um, you're gonna enjoy it, it's so much interesting content, so be sure to check out part two when I finally get around to uploading that one as well. Um, but yeah, let's run the intro and get straight to it. the bottom of the historic Warren Hill here in Newmarket and I thought what better place than to catch up with one of Faroe's most renowned names. Uh, he's a worldwide clinician, he's an honourable associate of the uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, he's a fellow of the Worshipful Company of Farriers, he's recently become a doctor and author of multiple Farrier textbooks. So Simon Curtis, welcome to the YouTube channel. Hello Alex. So tell me a little bit about yourself, so how long have you been here in Newmarket for? Well I was born here. Right, I know okay. most farriers come here, and most yeah. people come to Newmarket. Me myself, yeah. Yeah, but I, uh, I was born here. I was born less than a mile from here. Right. Um, until I was ten years old, I thought every town in the world was like Newmarket, with horses crossing the road and mm. uh, and a great heath to come up and play on in the afternoon. And um, uh, so I grew up here, and I came from a family of farriers. Uh, my family had shod in this area of, of England. Well, certainly for 150 years. I don't go back yep. any further. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had no desire to be a farrier. Right, I went okay. to school and uh, at 16, I left school and I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I said to my father about coming down the forge, and do you know what, within days, I was intrigued by this job and loved it. Yeah. So, um, so that, was, that was fortuitous, maybe it was in my blood. Uh, when I joined the forge, there was uh, my father and his three brothers there and then the year after I started my elder brother started he went and did right. a really funny thing he stayed on at school till he was 18 right um, and then my younger brother Nick um, he started the year after that so at one uh, point okay. there were seven Curtises in the wow. forge yeah. and uh, we were at that point at least 95% racing we right. although I used to go out and shoe a few ponies with my dad uh, by and large, we were 95% racing. We used to do racing yards in the morning yeah. and uh, stud farms in the afternoon. That was the usual plan, yeah. and that's how a lot of farriers still yeah. work their businesses mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. today. Yeah, yeah. So how did you feel sort of coming into that environment where you had that all that history of your family and then sort of taking, you know, sort of uh, well, wanting to not, do it yourself? I don't, it's never been, it's, it wasn't a burden. I mean, I admired my father. Um, he, long before, Farriers started flying all over the world or being flown here and there for clients. Uh, in the 60s, he was going out to Peru and Brazil for right, jockey okay. clubs, Turkey. So he was the first, so he was I'd say it. he was the yeah. first real mm -hmm. flying farrier. So uh, obviously there was always that in my mind thinking, oh, I could do that. Yeah, yeah, could, yeah, and of course, yeah. I, I, my joke is I've ended up covering the countries that he missed. Right. So, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, we all, well, most of us are lucky enough to grow up admiring our fathers. and. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I admired that part. Um, my apprenticeship with him lasted 11 months. It was different days right, then. Right, okay. Uh, sorry, it lasted three months. I had 11 months he sent me with another farrier in town because he believed my school reports that I was lazy and useless. Right. And um, so he sent me just up the road, up the top of the Berry Road. There was a nice yard there that we did with a little forge. And so I right. didn't go yeah. in the family forge for the first oh, okay. 11 months. Okay. Then I said to my dad, oh, I'm not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Oh, come with me." And we had uh, I had three months with him. So after 14 months, my apprenticeship finished, and I was shooting the second biggest yard in Newmarket really? at, wow. at okay. 17 years of age. That's, so yeah. I do sometimes smile about um, our snowflake apprentices who who you, you give them 25 horses to do in their third year. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, when when they're 20 years old and they think this is impossible. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it was different days then, yeah, you know, that's the way yeah. things were done yeah. and you, you got on yeah. with it and there was nothing wrong with that um, at all really, different yeah. sort of apprenticeship. Yeah. I mean we yeah. handmade all our own shoes. Right, even the, even the 
ones for the racehorses? All the races? Well, the funny thing is at that time was you couldn't actually get decent um, factory made shoes right, for racehorses. Okay. Yeah. You, by mm -hmm. then you could get decent hunter shoes yeah. and sports horse shoes. Right. But the racehorse shoes were the last ones to be, shall we say, good quality. Mm -hmm. So we hand made them. Well, and we even employed yeah. people who made shoes all day long. Well, huh, well. Um, and as, a, as an apprentice farrier, just to put it in perspective, I was paid £9 a week. Yeah. But I got um, 75 pence for making 12 shoes, which I could do in an hour. <laughs> and I got another 25 pence if they were clipped up. So if you'd made a right, dozen okay. shoes, you got a pound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I could do that in an hour yeah. after three or four months. I'm not saying what the quality was, <laughs> but again, people don't believe. But you, you know, there was there was a few of us that could work mm -hmm. at that rate. Mm -hmm. So when did you um, go from sort of your apprenticeship into um, you know further education and, and and going down the lines of you know you mentioned about your father was travelling around the world. Uh, was that something you wanted to do straight away, or did you? I might have been develop? naive enough to believe that you could do. I think I was naive enough to believe that. Yeah, I'll do this for a few years of apprenticeship, shoot a few yeah. horses and yeah. I can go and travel. Well, of course, right. that yeah. isn't the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did 10 years where I was basically just clogging on. And, right. and as I say, shoeing mm -hmm. horses in the morning, uh, making shoes, uh, going on stud farms and trimming in the afternoon. And then the Registration Act came along and I was a part two farrier because I could show that I'd had training. Right. But I'd had no apprenticeship. I hadn't gone to college. Right, okay. for, yeah. I hadn't mm -hmm. gone to college for a day. That my father had stopped doing that with his chaps about two years before. Um, and they used to go at that time up to Melton Mowbray. The army right. actually used to yeah. train some civilian farriers. Right. And of course Melton Mowbray isn't so far from here, you can yeah. do it in an hour and a quarter. Uh, but my father stopped it because he said, What use is it? They don't mm -hmm. see a racehorse, they don't know anything about racehorses. That's despite the fact my father was an associate which right. was a bit unusual, yeah. especially for farriers in town. Most farriers were, didn't have a qualification. Right, okay. So I, um, I suddenly thought when the act came in, I don't want to be part two of anything. Yeah. So I took my diploma. As I said, I'd already been making lots of mm -hmm. shoes, so I actually just adapting. Um, the horse I shot in my diploma was the third horse I'd ever hot shot. Right. Uh, and again, that's why I think when people make such a big fuss about things, um, yeah. you know, sh good shoeing is good shoeing. So I passed that, but I, I'm one of those weirdos that actually likes exams. Right, okay. Um, I just think that exams like... You like, like the adrenaline from them? I think so, I must do. And I like, I don't think they like a quiz. I like <laughs> pub quizzes. It's just like doing a quiz, yeah, yeah, an exam. Yeah. And, um, and so then I thought, oh, I actually genuinely, and again, it might be a bit arrogant, I thought, I want to be a fellow because I've met a couple of fellows. And then I thought, well, I've got to do my associate first. So I did my associate mm -hmm. in order to do my fellowship. And, right, um, okay. and even today, the minimum you can do it in is in five years. So I thought, I'll do that in five years. Well, we all have to have targets, but I did it in seven years. I don't right, think that's okay. too bad. Yeah, yeah, so I good. went for, in seven years from being a plater in Newmarket who'd never hot shot a horse mm -hmm. to being a fellow. To being a fellow. Wow. That's something um, but, it, you know, it was... Uh, I enjoyed it. And was that was one of the, the first courtesies to reach the fellowship? It was, it was the, uh, yeah, the first one really? ever. Yeah. I mean, as I say, my father was an associate. Yeah. Two of his brothers were um, RSS, or as it mm -hmm. now is, his diploma, and one, yeah. uh, and one had no qualification. So, right. um, and he was the one that lasted longest in the show, and you know, he was yeah. the last one until he passed away a number of years ago. Um, uh, so it was different then, different mm -hmm. days, really. Okay. You're, you're now this. You're now a fellow, and and, and where, where do you go from from there on? Okay. Well, what happened uh, before I passed my fellowship was that the Worship Company of Farriers did um, an essay competition, as they called it, three thousand words. Uh, Princess Royal was master of the Worship Company of Farriers at the time, and every farrier in the country got invited to take part in that. And I'm, I certainly didn't think I could win, but it did say that the. Um, the final three finalists will be in, in, interviewed and I thought oh, I might be able to get to the interview stage so I did that and I won it and the company ran it for five years and I won it um, twice in that time uh, but what that did is apart from that brought me to the attention of, of various barriers at the time shall we say who were eminent barriers and, mm -hmm. and vets and yeah. worship company barriers um, it gave me confidence to write 
Right, okay. You know, like most farriers, I'm not some cuddly little yeah. left winger, you know, I'm, I'm more a shaker and a slapper. But, it, you know, so when people say, oh, you've got to encourage these. Um, but it did have that effect. I thought, oh, maybe I can write. And so I uh, started writing articles uh, for The Forge, for uh, equine journals, because they're always looking for them, um, and even for veterinary journals. You know, I had a close association with Peter Roscoe, who was editor yeah. of Equine Veterinary Journal and Equine Veterinary Education at the time. So he encouraged me as well with veterinary papers. I then did my, th my thesis and my fellowship. Um, I was asked to become an exam examiner. So by then I was getting fairly well known. Yeah. Um, I would say, I, I don't know whether it still exists, but there was a slight, shall we say, anti-racing uh, feeling, you know, Plato oh, okay. as a farrier. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the farriers tended to look down their nose at it. But I actually used it to my advantage because they couldn't believe that here was this Mm -hmm. uh, Plater, who had, who had passed the fellowship, who could write, way, who was yeah. quite happy to stand up in front of an audience and speak. Yeah. Um, so I never, it, far from trying to hide that, I actually uh, used to um, uh, use it to my advantage and used to stress that. So I started to do all this writing and then I thought, uh, you know, they say everybody's got a book mm -hmm. in them. And, I, yeah. and I, I believe that and I know people that say that usually they're really talking yeah. about a novel. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a novel. Mm -hmm. I had a I had a textbook and, and I just had this idea that um, I wanted to write a book showing what Farriery was in racing. So starting from the foal all the way into training, so yeah. showing them as yearlings, um, what you have to do in training to keep horses sound, mm -hmm. and then when they come out the other end, when they're right. broodmares yeah. and stallions, and just take the whole lot. Hence, Barry Refolder Racehorse, which, race was the, yeah. um, which came out, it seems incredible now, because it's actually going to be 20 years next February, so it's wow. almost 20 wow. years now. Yeah. Um, and at the time, um, I thought, I might be out to sell some books. Well, it's still in print, it's mm. in its fifth print, yeah. and um, okay, it's not, it doesn't sell thousands a year, but it does yeah. sell yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely a book that I used uh, in my apprenticeship, and it was certainly recommended it right from the beginning, right from when I started, along with um, you know some of the other books that they talk about, the, the old Hickman's Fiery yeah. and, and Your Fault to Racehorse, and, and even Corrective Fiery towards the end of my yeah. uh, apprenticeship were, were books that you know we all referred to as, as uh, you know as, as real good sort of uh, material for oh, you know, right. to get that qualification at the end of it. Yeah, and that and that's mm -hmm. why I think that's why you do it. When I then then so having done that, I thought about what is the next step. And by then, of course, I've been examining quite a while, and there was no textbook for the associate exam. Right. And that was always when when you write a book, you have to try and keep the vision the whole time because mm -hmm. you tend to wander off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to keep pulling yourself back in. Yeah. So that was that was relatively easy for fault racers because I've told you what the vision was, yep. just yep. to follow what a thoroughbred does from the start of its mm -hmm. life all the way through, uh, from a farrier's point of view. Corrective farriery. I realised there was too much there to go into one book. Yeah. So I think people yeah. still don't really realise, some people, that Corrective Fairy 1 and 2 is actually one book cut yeah. in half. Yeah, yeah. It, mm -hmm. Corrective Fairy 2 is not an update. It's, yeah. it, and in fact, at the end of Corrective Fairy 2, there's an index which indexes both books to save people having to okay, flip yeah. through mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, so my vision for that was, what are all the, what's all the knowledge and all the skills that a farrier needs to have to pass the associate yeah. and uh, I thought about all the authors that could contribute to that so it's a multi-author book um, I had an interest it was quite an interesting thing employing both uh, uh, should we say eminent vets and farriers and, and a couple of scientists that were neither uh, to write you learn something about people by asking the right few. The yep, ones yep. I respected were the ones that said, no, I can't do it, Simon, I'm right, too busy, okay. yeah, yeah. or I'm doing it. Uh, the ones we say I had little fallouts with were the ones that two years after the start of the project still had sent me nothing. Right, yeah. And then I'm thinking, well, I really need this chapter, do yeah, I shift yeah. to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, I'm never going to say the names, but there were one or two that got yeah, the sack. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> and, you know, when you've got over 30 authors, which yeah. is across those mm -hmm. two books, wow. um, so I always say I'm never going to do a multi-author book again. Yeah, yeah. It's a blinking nightmare, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. But nevertheless, 
Um, it, it, I was really pleased with the way they came out. And, and again, you know, they still sell in large numbers. We're, um, uh, I think we're on the third reprint of Corrective Barry 1 and the second reprint of Corrective Barry 2. And, and I imagine they sell all around the world. They well. do, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, I, I learned a lesson recently where you realise that a lot of people have forgot and, and there's a whole new generation, you know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. after 20 years, even Corrective Barry Read, the, the yeah. last one is about 12 years old ago. Right. Um, so, so you realise that people forget and there's a whole new generation of farriers. Yeah. So we have tried in the last, during the last year to remind people and that's why I've tried to be better at or Facebook, I was yeah. say me, mm -hmm. um, I have um, um, one of my daughters who works one day a week trying to promote these things because you realise yeah. that people can't buy something if they don't know it exists. Don't know it exists of course, yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do, we're trying yeah. to keep reminding people they exist and, and it has had a good Good effect. Good. So you've now um, you've now just brought out a new book. So just tell us what's what's the new book all about, and when when is it going to be when is it going to be available? To okay, uh, the new book is just about finished. I did the final um, copy proofing yesterday. Right. Um, I go in. Uh, it's being set up and designed by a company, a New Market. I like to do things locally, yep. mm -hmm. uh, cubic design, and. Um, so I have to do that, I have to, it's all been designed by them, it's been written by me totally, uh, it's been uh, edited, um, or I should say more revised by uh, three readers. I've had a very good farrier, Mark Trussler, uh, a very good vet, Richard Stevenson, who's currently chairman of our exam board, mm -hmm. and uh, Jan Wade, who actually helped me produce my previous three books. Right. So I've got her to come out of yeah, retirement. Yeah. And, and people don't realise you need that because even though I've been writing for two years, you actually don't see your own mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a, that's a yeah. well-known yeah. thing in writing because you actually only scan when you read through your own work. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. need other people to look at it. But we've gone through all that. Um, all the pictures are in, it's set out. Hopefully I can show you a few um, proofs yeah. later. I can't yeah, show you the book because it's, it's, not, it's, it's not, not there, printed, not yeah. for three weeks. Yeah. Um, we have um, an online launch date uh, November 12th. Right, okay. Uh, now, if I say to you online launch, you know that this is not happening at any place apart from in the ether. Yeah. Sadly, we've got people asking where they have to go right, to go okay. to this online launch. So that's another, you know, um, what should we say, learning curve. That yeah. So Simon's been very kind to invite us back to his office. Uh, so we're going to head over there now with Simon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the book, but um, to just finish off here, Simon, you know, you've been in Newmarket for, for your entire life. What is it that you love about well, being here in Newmarket? That's easy to say when we're standing at the bottom of the heap. I mean, you know, this is the spot that racing began. Yeah. I, I would say that, obviously, the moment two people rode on, a, on a, their horses, one would say, my horse is faster than yours. Yeah. So it isn't the first place that horses were raced. They were raced from the time yeah. people rode them. But this was the first place that was organised on this very hill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's getting relatively quiet at this time of year and it's sort of a bit late on a Saturday morning. But you can see anybody who loves horses, they don't even have to love mm -hmm. racing. If they love yeah. horses, then this is a place to see something, a town that just um, exists only because of the racing and is full of horses. Um, yeah, I just... I love it. And who couldn't love? Who couldn't? In, yeah. in, in the middle of October, mm -hmm. uh, here where it's uh, unbelievably warm, yeah, it <laughs> we're here in shirts yeah. on, mm -hmm. in, in October. Yeah, it's, it's lovely, you know, and you, and you just see the horses having a gentle. It would have been beautiful this morning with the sky. Did you see the pink sky that was over here? I didn't get up as early oh, as you, yeah. Alex. Some of us were up <laughs> nice and early this morning, but it was a beautiful morning here in Newmarket. Uh, just as the sun came up over, over Warren Hill, it gave that sort of pink glimmer to the sky so it is really it really is a beautiful place and uh, I certainly enjoy working here and I'm sure you have yeah. your entire life okay so if we can head back um, we're gonna head back over to Simon's office now and uh, we'll pick up where we left carry off. on Let's do it.
fellowship. Mm. So you got your fellowship, and then what was it that made you want to go down the lines of uh, your degree? Okay, well, after the fellowship, I got into slightly the. the there was a 10 year gap um, when I was writing books, did the politics a bit, became right. chairman yeah. of the council. I hope nobody holds that against me. Um, and then I heard about this degree and I talked to John Riley, who was um, a professor there at the mm -hmm. time. And I'd known John Riley because he'd written a couple of chapters in Corrective Farriery. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, um, because it was a five year part time degree, and he said, uh, Well, you won't have to do all of that, will you? And I said, Why not? And he said, No, because you've, you've got the fellowship and that will count towards certain things, and we can uh, give you um, recognition of prior learning, you see. Uh, they didn't give me quite as much as, as was promised me. Right, yeah. And I did quite find it quite amusing that the module on foals, which I taught on, mm -hmm. Uh, they made me do, the university said, no, he's got to do this module. Right. So I thought, I don't know who would be more embarrassed if I fail this, yeah. the university or me. Um, but, it, but it was a great, great experience. Um, it was time for me to uh, learn more, shall we say. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'd stop learning, but yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a more structured uh, opportunity. Uh, so I threw myself into it. I had um, a lot of material from doing my foals so I wanted to look at flexural deformities and how that leads to club foot. Right. Um, yeah. I'd actually already got that material although it's never a good plan uh, really to start collecting data until you know exactly yeah. mm -hmm. what your question is mm -hmm. but nevertheless I got away with it yeah. um, I, I'd already got that um, and so that was my main thesis so that, that was my dissertation and uh, although it's never been published in uh, a peer-reviewed journal as such, it has been right. used at quite a high-level conference, so uh, it is available to people. Yeah. It was in mm -hmm. a conference, uh, veterinary medicine conference of Geneva, so okay. it, was, it yeah. was a pretty high-powered conference. Um, and I still had the bug, just like I got yeah. the bug from the diploma and started yeah, doing yeah. the associate mm -hmm. and then the fellowship. I got the bug from that, and even before I'd finished it, uh, I had a chat with John Riley and uh, Sarah Hobbs, Dr. Sarah Hobbs, who teaches at the University of Central Lancashire, mm -hmm. and they uh, encouraged me to do a master's. And now, a part-time master's is only two years. Right. And we, you know, two years is nothing. If yeah. you're, you're full-time yeah. at the university, you, you, you do it in yeah. a year, mm -hmm. but two years. And about a month before, um, I was going to start that. I spoke to the university and they explained that you can do a part-time PhD in six years. Right. Uh, Full-time is three years. Now six yeah. years yeah. is start, you start That's to think about, time, yeah. well, yeah, yeah, but you know, once you reach my age and I was in my mid-fifties then, you realise that time really flies. Yeah. Um, and I said yes to that. Uh, right. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, I'd already got my degree, so that gained me entrance mm -hmm. to do the PhD. So I was already thinking more in academic terms. Yeah. Um, I was, although I was part-time student, I still at that point was not a part-time farrier. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, yeah. The thing about universities is there's a difference in academia. When they say a year, mm -hmm. they actually mean thirty weeks. Yeah. Farriers yeah. say a year, they mean 52 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they also mean 18 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So this was a big advice to me. All my life I'd worked, I, I wasn't like some farriers, I'm not saying I'd worked seven days a week, mm -hmm. but I'd always worked five and a half days yeah. a week. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't finish yeah. on a Saturday until almost lunchtime. And of course at certain times of year I haven't worked Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, so that wasn't a problem and as for the hours well you know you you do so i dedicated uh monday i used to call that my academic day right <coughs> so if i did 10 hours there yeah well, i actually fit in the other eight hours you know yeah. a couple of mm -hmm. long evenings yeah and i'm there yeah so um so yes you have to put the time in and i put the time in and whatever people think i am actually quite a slow learner and a slow writer right okay but you know, I it, just put those hours in and exactly. Yeah, I have it, persistence, yeah, yeah, and grit and motivation, and those are actually what get you through. Yeah, because I think it's probably um, one of the things that may put 
you know, all the fire is off that, you know, wants to learn a little bit more or go down the lines of maybe a degree or studying for their associate. Mm -hmm. It's then trying to find how do they keep their business going mm -hmm. as well as, you know, becoming this part-time student, shall we say, but still having to make mm -hmm. up their hours. And I, I, can, I can see, and it was one of the things when I started mine, uh, where you're going to find this time, you know, to fit all this study in, you know. It, is there anything you can sort of recommend for you know people that are in maybe in that well, situation? Well, I think I think it is unhealthy to shoo six or seven days a week, yeah, yeah. and it, you know you can either spread the shoeing out and shoe like I have until I'm 62, mm -hmm. and I'm still shoeing and uh, yeah. I'm trying to cut down, right. and I keep cutting down. But you know, 46 years, or you can yeah. burn out. Yeah. You yeah. know, by the time you're 40. Now, people yeah. make the choice, mm -hmm. and one of the ways that helps you not burn out is to do something different. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's yeah. not just healthy for you, yeah. Um, yeah. it's interesting, yeah. it reinvigorates your enjoyment of farriery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's a bit like an office worker, it's quite good for them to go out and have a it's run general. and dig the garden. Yeah. For yeah. us, yeah. as doing yeah. a physical job, yeah. it is actually quite good to sit at a desk, mm -hmm. or sit and read a book, or go yeah. and look at something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I am not one of those, and I find it an insult where people think our job is, is skill and not brains. Yeah. You know, yeah. I would say the most yeah. important muscle is the one between your ears. Absolutely. With, with, yeah. Without a good yeah. brain, your hands don't yeah. work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I refuse to go down that line, but I do think that actually uh, trying to do something almost purely academic. Yeah. is actually good for you as well you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. and, and the great thing the great luck that we have as farriers is so little has been studied yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course that includes for a fellowship if people want to do the fellowship thesis yeah. which is a high level people yeah. must not mm -hmm. um, kid themselves it's, yeah. you know I've done the fellowship and I've done the degree and, yeah. and I can mm -hmm. tell you what fellowship thesis is every bit as tough as a right. degree thesis yeah. so yeah. So um, uh, people need to accept that it's tough. But the great thing about doing a thesis and the great thing about doing uh, studying for the degree is, uh, it sounds strange, but you ask the question because mm -hmm. you get to choose. Yeah, yeah. I found it unusual when I stepped up to PhD. Yeah. I still chose exactly what I wanted to study. Now I had yeah. to convince the university that that was, that was sure. yeah. something that was a proper mm -hmm. study and it was possible for me to do it to the level of PhD. Um, but I wasn't told what I had to study. Mm. Now, I met people on the opening day and we had various courses where you all do the course together. Yeah. There's people, for example, um, studying electronics in the aviation industry mm. and doing a PhD. They're told exactly what bit. Right. Should we say of the rocket yeah. that they're building. Right, yeah. They, they mm. don't get a choice. And I found it strange and I thought, well, how much nicer it was it for me. Weird. That, and I just ran it past uh, my supervisors, as yeah. I say, as long as I could convince them yeah. Yeah. that this had value. <clears throat> and universities, quite rightly, are always saying, how does this help your industry? Yeah. In other words, we all read about these PhDs of something you think, well, how can, what nonsense yeah. that is, yeah. how can people study yeah. that? Yeah. But universities are actually under pressure mm -hmm. to help the country economically, and therefore, I, if I filled it in once, I must have filled in 10 different forms which said what impact right. yeah. will this have on your industry. Right. And there's been a study done on what impact my study had on the industry. And I know a lot of people filled yeah. it in. Yeah. It, um, it was the usual um, survey monkey, mm -hmm. but it was put yeah. out by the university, not me. Right. Okay. And they got, I think they got a thousand answers. They were really pleased yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, that, that so many people around the world you know, farriers, vets, horse owners, yeah. people that are interested in the horses yeah. filled, filled it in. Now, I don't know what they said, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. allowed to see that. Right, okay. Um, all I can say is the university said, um, you were right, you came yeah, out of it, okay, Simon. Well, well, that's good. And, and, yeah. and that really, actually, that's helped the University of Central Lancashire, which I know you're yep. looking to do a degree at. Yeah. That's given them more confidence to say we're going down the right line right, to okay. try and help yeah. farriers do this. Yeah, well, that's good. So, yeah. so it, it sort of did some good them doing yeah. this. That As I say, good. it was a study of what mm -hmm. I've done. Mm -hmm. And I like that because you know, and it's one of the things you know, you've just discussed. What sort of um, you know gets you sort of your brain going and wanting to sort of do these studies, and it's. It's the side of fiery that really intrigues me and it's, um, you know, I always question things and I'm always thinking, well, why is that the way yeah. it is? You know, how, it, how does this shoe, um, 
and it did uh, did it to some extent through the diploma. Um, but now with the with the the chance now on you know, in my second year of doing the degree, um, you know, it's those sort of answers that I want to be asking now yeah. and actually getting you know doing my own research and getting the answers for it. And I think it's you know it's so important for myself. But you know, do you think continuing education, is, you know, it is important for farriers and is it the way that the industry is going to progress say over the next five ten years? It's probably the person who's done more continuing education than any yeah. other farrier yeah, yeah. on earth without mm -hmm. exaggeration mm -hmm. uh, it would be a pretty poor answer if I said no, no it's yeah, not worth doing yeah no it, and it, but it, the thing is I always used to have farriers say to me that won't earn you another penny you won't earn any more money that. yeah wrong Mm -hmm. It's totally wrong. Right, okay. a, all educa no education is wasted. But I think there's even this um, non-tangible side that as a farrier that just getting your associate, mm -hmm. you give over more an air of confidence. Yeah. In the background you know more, your skills are being enhanced, so mm -hmm. you are a better farrier. Yeah. Now you can't put a price on it, you can't no. say I now earn yeah. £5 a set more, $10 a set more, whatever. Yeah. We know you can't do that, but I actually think you do earn money more. Right. Money. Then it comes to the point of the more academic qualifications. Um, you know, the world recognises a degree. The world mm -hmm. recognises a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, I used to joke all the time I was doing my PhD because <clears throat> universities bombard you with um, emails asking you about your PhD. Firstly, they all assumed I was 25. Right. So it was sort of what you're going to do in your future career. And I want to say, I'm going to retire. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, so they asked questions like that because although they want mature students, they mm -hmm. sort of not set up. Yeah. Um, but I used to joke with people and say, no, I'm not only not going to earn a penny more from my PhD, it's probably cost me money and who knows, it might have cost me clients because yeah. instead of being yeah. shoeing a horse in Newmarket, yeah. I was driving up the M6 yeah. to mm -hmm. Preston. Mm -hmm. As you know, it's a wonderful yeah. road, <laughs> or it might be in five years' time. Um, but even that wasn't true, and you thought mm -hmm. I might have had more confidence because um, in the uh, two years since I gained my PhD, I've had some very valuable work given to me right. as both a consultant and other aspects because because I've got a PhD. Because you've done it. Yeah. And, and it's mm -hmm. the same with the master, and it's the same with the degree. Obviously, yeah. Yeah. the one thing about a PhD is you get doctor before your name, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and that sort of changes a lot of things. Um, but all of them add value, and they add monetary value. They, yeah. they add value, as I say, to your fe feeling of well-being. Mm -hmm. um, they add value because you have another interest, and yeah. Farrier's are renowned for not having yeah. Yeah. other interests. Interest. And all right, it yeah. might still be an interest in something yeah. to do with a yeah. hoof, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's not bent over banging nails. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so it has lots of value. So um, uh, despite the fact that I you know, always hoped it would Help me. I never thought it'd help me monetarily. Right. Yeah. And it has. Mm -hmm. What? What? <clears throat> I'm quite interested in. Uh, some people, you know, I've heard some people maybe off the cuff comments or you know whatever it may be. Oh, modern fiery and things like that. Uh, maybe steering away from more traditional methods. Um, now that you've gone down, you know, through your, your associate, your fellowship, your degree, uh, and now your doctorate. Um, and looking back on some of the books that we discussed earlier, um, has your opinion changed on any particular topics? Uh, have you discovered or uncovered things that maybe you were, um, you know, didn't have that when you were first writing your book? So, is the new book that's coming out, you know, is that maybe an updated version on some things? Um, or no, no, it's not an update. It's coming at things from a totally different direction, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But. Yeah. But firstly, your question about farriery, and um, I actually, one of the important things about the Worship Company of Farriers exams is that the traditional skills are still examined. Yeah. In other words, mm -hmm. it's all very well people saying you don't need to make a shoe now, we can buy yeah. them all. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you cannot buy every shoe you need. Mm -hmm. And even the shoes you buy, you sometimes need to adapt. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched somebody who's had no training in shoemaking try and adapt a shoe. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you're left-handed, Alex, but I would say they look like they've got two left hands, yeah. which yeah, that's probably just mm. upset one-eighth of the population, <laughs> but you know what I mean, they look awkward, yeah. they don't look yeah. comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, although very few people make shoes every day, 
the ability to make a good shoe mm -hmm. means you have the ability to adjust, to adjust a shoe well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so traditional skills need to still be there. I'll give you an example of, I taught a guy how to glue shoes on. Um, mm -hmm. I was the first person doing the method which I think is still the most successful method probably in the world but certainly in the UK and in racing of bonding mm -hmm. aluminium plates on. So mm -hmm. I was the first person in the UK to do that. I did not invent it but I yeah. learned it in America and I right. brought yeah. it back. And, and it's quite important a lot of the things that you do. But I taught a guy to do that and he was a good farrier and he said to me the horse I've just done has gone lame three or four days after I did it. And I said, come on, go and have a look. Yes. Well, it was so out of balance, the shoe. Right. So in other words, he'd concentrated so much on gluing the shoe on, that he'd forgotten, he'd forgotten the just this basic. Yeah. And of course, mm -hmm. as we know with glue, yeah. it's actually even easier to balance. You yeah. just push down a little bit harder on one side. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, as the glue's going off, but he, he'd, he'd thrown that out of the window. Right. He'd yeah. got so concentrated, he'd never glued a shoe on. I'd shown him how to do it. He'd gone off to do the horse that he is, is why I, he'd come to meet and learn right. how to do it, and, and he'd forgotten, and he was a good farrier. He wouldn't right. normally unbalance it for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see what I mean, that you must, in other words, all modern stuff is add-on. Yeah. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not replacement yeah. for other skills. So it makes our job um, harder in a way. Mm -hmm. We get better results, but yeah. um, it means we have to learn more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I think is why there's been this explosion of... Um, uh, of CPD, uh, you know, continual um, professional development, which is a great thing, um, uh, and there needs to be. You know, uh, the modern materials part of the associate. Um, I actually wrote that syllabus. It, it didn't right. exist 15 years ago. Yeah. My goodness, I had a battle to fight. Really. I even had. Um, I remember once candidate turned up, and they actually lobbied and said we don't do that sort of stuff. At which point right. as an examiner I said well don't do it then but yeah. if you can afford to throw 20% yeah. of your marks away mm, yeah. fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it an extraordinary um, attitude um, but they came back a year later and I think three out of the four passed because right, okay. they'd yeah. gone and found out how to do yeah. some of these things. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now think, I was going to tell you something else and I forgot didn't I? You did, yeah. And you've forgotten as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was, it, I think it was, um, it was to do PhD, I don't know. What was it? I don't know. Um, I always do that. I'm sorry if I went off down a, a long track. Um, the PhD, I think um, directly, did I learn new things? Um, well, of course, what uh, in a university is one of the things they examine you on, especially at PhD level, is uh, what it has to be novel, it has to be new. Right. Yeah. You can't rewrite somebody else's work. You can't yeah. re. I mean, you revisit it because you um, you have to do your literature yeah. search and you have to learn about what everybody else has done. Mm -hmm. But but the whole point is um, to have new material and, and um, new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, I had five or six things in the PhD, and I know right. my external examiner. Yeah. Actually, asked my ex other examiner. Um, is this true what Simon's saying in his PhD that this isn't known and this isn't known and this isn't known? Right. And and you know that's what I mean. We yeah. we and there's so little known about the hoof and the way it develops mm -hmm. and what shoeing does to it that, that we have this open field. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know that, that maybe in 20 years' time when there's been a lot of people, people might find it harder to find new things to study. Mm -hmm. At the moment. There's so much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah. what it's what's called low apples. So in other words, we don't have to climb up the tree to pick yeah. the apples. Yeah. We can reach them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so it's wonderful. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example of, of what I didn't study and what somebody needs to. Yeah. Every farrier in this world will tell you the best place to put stud holes, right? Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way of testing that. Yeah. We need to find out, and maybe it's different for different sports, different surfaces, yeah. but we don't know any of that. It's all mm -hmm. just opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the sort of thing where people say, well, what's science got to do with farrier? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, science has got everything to do with farrier. Yeah. The shoes we use now have steel in them because of work done 200 years ago to develop yeah. steel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the aprons we use, some of us who can remember the old little thin aprons we had, you know, some of our aprons now are quite high tech, with back yeah, support, yeah, even the clips yeah. Yeah. that we use. 
You know, the gas fires we use use about a fifth of the fifth gas, of the gas yeah. they used when I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mainly yeah. due to science and developing better yeah. insulation. So yeah. everything is science. Yeah. yeah. We just need more science that, that where we can say to carriers, if you do it this way, mm -hmm. it's easier, it's better for the horse, and you earn yeah. more money. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with all of those. No. No. So so yes, you can tell I'm a, a great advocate of science, and yeah. um, I, I think it's a it, it's not in conflict with our traditional. Skills. Yeah. It's an add-on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think um, you know a lot, a lot referred to sort of the an is it um, sort of it's been very sort of antidotal um, in regards to you know our learning of oh, furry. That's not the right it's word. Not no, it's not it's it anecdotal. It's anecdotal. Anyway, so well, anecdotal evidence is really evidence from a story. Yeah. Um, and you know a lot of and, and yes, the vast majority is anecdotal. There is nothing wrong with, with uh, knowledge and skills learnt through mm. custom, provided people are open-minded enough to question. Yeah. Actually, funny enough, that was what we were going to talk about, was the, yeah. was the questions. Yeah. And, and all good science has a question. You said you like to question things. Me, I would say I'm a contrarian. Right. If somebody yeah. tells me the sky is blue, I'm you looking to, to prove it's green. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's a good attitude to have. But um, yeah, so, so anecdotal evidence, uh, is is when we say I saw a horse with a foot like this. Mm -hmm. The funny the funny thing is, of course, farriers can't get that out of their mind at times. So I present at a, a conference, and I say I've looked at 373 foals, and um, and uh, this is what I found. And and then somebody will put their hand up and say, you know, I had a foal once, and I think, well. Yeah, you had a fault once, but I studied 373. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so they're often what are either called outliers or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. there, there are always oddities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing it's often called is the black swan. So right. that um, you only need to have one black swan to prove that all yeah. swans aren't white, mm -hmm. which yeah. is fine. Yeah. So anybody that ever tells you anything is 100% or 0% yeah. is lying. Yeah. Nothing is 100%. Nothing is, yeah. It's like um, there is no shoeing treatment which is 100% successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we, if we deride something and say that never works, well, actually, the reason somebody's done it is because it's worked once. Yeah. But you know, the shoes that I'm pretty convinced were put into our syllabus many years ago, and I've made it my life's work to get rid of them right. because they were one farrier who perhaps was an examiner. Yeah. Um, 50 years ago that liked that shoe and got it in. I mean, one of the ones okay. is, the, is the diamond toed shoe. Mm -hmm. I refuse to believe, and it was me that got it out of the associate syllabus, so right, you didn't okay. have to make one, yeah. Alex. I refuse to believe that any horse overreaching manages to get this point between the bulbs of the heels and also the two scoop yeah. bits miss out yeah. in the other bulb. You know, yeah. uh, I think actually what it was was a dub toed shoe and that little that little point allowed you to draw a little clip, but that's oh, right, my okay. theory on it. Right. But I think it got there, and people, yeah. can't, you know, and people said, "Oh, you got to have a you got to have a, a diamond toed shoe in yeah. your in your shoe board." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we couldn't find anybody who'd ever put one on. Right. Okay. So it shouldn't yeah. be in a modern exam. So, yeah. so my thing always with the company's exams has been, um, they need to be, and they are constantly looked at, constantly mm -hmm. reviewed. Are they relevant to the modern day? Mm -hmm. If they're not relevant to the modern day, get it out. Get it out. Yeah. You know, I, I love my heritage mm -hmm. and, I, and I love uh, museum pieces, but I don't want our exams to be museum pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So, in other words, um, I help to get rid of tall, and, full and, sh tall right, okay. and fullering shoes. Now, people can do that in competitions if they like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, farriers used to have one switch block. Mm. And they'd make one one size. Yeah. Well, you can buy concave metal in, in twenty different yeah. Yeah. sections. Yeah. So that was a nonsense for a start. And in this day and age, and, and I had a, again, it was a battle I fought when I was a younger examiner. Mm. I'm now one of the old stages, so I'm determined not to do the same to these younger examiners. Um, you know, because that had been part of their life for mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years, and I said, yeah. but it, it's not relevant now. Yeah. Oh, it's a skill you need. Well, it's a skill, but mm -hmm. do it elsewhere. There's, there's yeah. too many skills you need to learn. For example, for an associate, yeah. as you know, yeah. to have stuff in that's not relevant to today. Yeah. Yeah. So that's always been my thing, and I'm hoping that 
at now, shall we say, I'm in the autumn of my career, yeah. that I don't become one of those, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I guess well recognise that as people get older, yeah. they do become more set in their ways. So yeah. you have to challenge yeah. yourself even more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to well, surround yourself sometimes with younger people, yeah. newer ideas. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're very lucky in that we've had about 10 new fellows in the last three or four years, quite mm -hmm. remarkable number. Yeah. Probably yeah. never in the history yeah. has there been that number. Yeah. And, and they all have lots of virtues, ideas, enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and they have the traditional skills as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're, so we're at a very good point in Farriery, yeah. I think, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, obviously around the world, Farriery is becoming more international, more crossover of mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, farriers are just are both physically flying here and there, and as you know, uh, in, they, they get the chance to learn stuff virtually. They get the chance to yeah. look at your yeah. um, videos, they get the chance to, to buy my book. So, mm -hmm. so it is a different world. It's a, it's a way different world to the one that I started in 40 or 50 years ago. Okay guys, so I'm going to leave it there for part one. Um, be sure to come back for part two. Uh, I know it is a long interview, but I'm sure you're well aware, you know, it's a fascinating story. You know, one of Farrery's, uh, you know, most reputable guys, most knowledgeable, and certainly uh, most respected. So, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I know I sort of joked around with some of these models at the beginning of this video, but they are up on the website now. Uh, you can get them. They are full anatomical replicas. Uh, I've done the knee. I've done the hock, the knee, and the lower leg. I've got a couple of them here. Uh, this is an example of the lower leg, and they're great. They're, it's all the all the detail that's on these bones. You know, here's an example of the knee here. Um, you know, full uh, f all the detail you could possibly need, and it's just such a good either a teaching aid um, or even you know if you want to do further exams or you want to do your diploma or your your associate, whatever it may be. They're great for just sort of getting your head around the anatomy, uh, really sort of getting your hands on there and and, and bringing that to life. So. If you are interested in these guys, they are up on the website, uh, so be sure to check that out. I'll drop a link uh, below so you can um, head straight over there. So be sure to check back for part two, guys. Um, thanks for watching. I'll see you again.